one's gonna be so much better than the last one. Oh my god. The last one was trash. The last one was trash. Hey. Not trash. <laughs> I'm joking. It's cool. <laughs> All right, just a little backdrop. I recorded this whole video and um, lost it. So I'm doing it again. Um, I'm so tired right now. It's not even funny. But we're going to get through this thing because God has a word for you and you are going to get this word tonight. All right. So originally I wanted to get on here and talk to you guys about the promises of God. But um, even with me talking to the Lord and getting before the Lord about his promises to me personally um, and just, you know, um, ministering to the Lord, um, it kind of turned into him speaking to me about something. And he gave me one scripture. The scripture is um, Exodus 14, 14. Exodus 14, 14 reads, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And he went through this journey with me um, through this one chapter in Exodus 14. And when he did that, at the end of it, he said, now share that with my people. And I was just like, oh, gosh, Lord, I don't know how to share your word with people. I know how to share your goodness. I know how to share your grace. I know how to share what you put me through. Uh, but sharing your word, I feel like there's like a, I don't know, like a standard or um, a qualification that comes with that. And um, it took me a few days, but here I am. So. That's the word that the Lord wants to share with you. Whoever it is, if you clicked on this video, the word is for you. And so that word is, the Lord will fight for you. He will fight for you. And all he wants you to do is be still. So I had to go through the whole chapter um, to get everything that God had for me. And it answered questions. It opened my eyes to things that I had not even considered before. And I want to go ahead and share that with you. And the only way to do that is to have you go on the journey with me, just like I did. And that's by reading the whole chapter 14 in Exodus, and we're going to do that together. Okay, so we are going to start with chapter 14, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi Hiroth. I may be saying that wrong, but I'm probably going to say a lot of different things wrong in, this, in the scriptures. Uh, um, so he wants them to encamp in front of Pi Hiroth, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. But Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land, the wilderness has shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, and they did so. So at this point, the Lord gave Moses a command to have the people of Israel um, camp or dwell in a place that made their enemies believe that they had the upper hand. Um, God told them also that the Pharaoh's that Pharaoh's heart will be hardened and that it was only to display his glory to him and his people and then the Israelites would know that God is Lord. So you might find yourself in a place where the Lord commanded you to go, whether it be a city, whether it be a uh, move to a different state, whether it be um, uh, a business endeavor, whether it be schooling, whatever that thing is, and then it'll seem like while you're there, after the command is obeyed, it may seem like Wait, it feels like my enemies have the upper hand over me in the place that you've called me to be. So let's go ahead and go to verse 5 through 9. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. So he had first said, yeah, we'll go ahead and let, in the previous chapter, he said, we're going to go ahead and let them go. Okay, he was pretty much forced into it. But he said he was going to let them go. But now he's saying, well, our minds are... Pharaoh's mind was changed um, to where the people and they said what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us so he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 of the best chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers all around them and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh king of Egypt and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly the Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and the horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped at the sea by, by Pi Heroth in front of Baal Zephon. So in the place that the Lord had actually called them to go, they listened to that command, they obeyed that command, they got there, and their enemies saw them as vulnerable. And in that very place is where they came and overtook them. This might be sounding familiar. This might be sounding familiar. I know it sounded familiar for me. So we're going to go ahead and jump down to verse 10. 
When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lift up, lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they feared greatly, and the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there was no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. All right now, listen to me. When I read that part, this is what the Lord showed me. I have to read it just how I wrote it. We might find ourselves comfortable in discomfort that's caused by ourselves or even our own enemies. But the discomfort that comes along with being in the will of God is sometimes too much for us to bear. Because these people of Israel were saying, it's better for us to be slaves in Egypt than a corpse in wilderness. Well, then that means you're saying, you'd rather the kind of discomfort that comes with being a slave than the discomfort that comes with being in the will of God. No, you don't know the end result. No, you don't know how it's going to end. Yes, it is scary. But you're actually telling me that you'd rather be in the messed up relationship than to be in um, a singlehood that may be making you feel uncomfortable? Or you're saying that, you know, I'd rather be dancing for money and having money come at me real fast and real quickly than to work a nine to five and not be really sure about when my next paycheck is gonna come or if it's gonna be enough to pay my bills. I might still be in your will, however, I'm still on edge. You know, that's the discomfort that we are kind of like, I don't know about, but the, dis the discomfort that comes along with the things that we kind of find ourselves in um, or people put us in or situations that people put us in, um, we can handle that. And sometimes we'll even actually prefer that. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump down to 13. Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will, shall never see again. The enemies that you see today, you will never see again. That situation that you are up against, you will never be up against that situation again. If you allow the Lord to work things out for you, he said, he said it right there, he said, um, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. That's saying that he's going to work that out for you today. And that thing that you're up against, that situation that you're up against, the person you're up against, the enemy that you're finding yourself battling, you will never find yourself battling that again if you let the Lord do it. Verse 14 says, the Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. The other translation says, the Lord will fight for you and all you need to do is be still. Okay, so verse 15 says, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. So in that verse, God is basically saying, right now is not the time. Right now is not the time to be crying to me and, and, and complaining. Right now is not the time to call your girlfriends or call your mama for advice. That is, this is not the time for that. This is the time to go ahead and get moving walk in the power that i've already given you right now is the time to walk in the power i've already given you right now is the time to exercise the authority that i've already given you and so if we're talking about authority and power that may not even look like what you may think it look like that just might mean to be prayerful to pray right now is the time to pray that's what the time is for right now is the time to affirm some things in your life speak to some mountains that need to move out of your way speak to some strongholds that need to be uh, broken. Um, uh, right now is the time to use your faith. Be faithful. Sometimes it's not even a prayer issue. Sometimes it's something that you're not doing. And that thing might just be to be in faith. He's asking that you just believe his word. He's just saying, hey, believe me. Believe that I'm going to pull you out of this. So he told Moses, hey, why are you guys doing all of that? No, no, no. What I need you to do is use the power I've given you. Verse 17 says, and I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all of his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. So God is basically saying, hey, I'm going to harden the hearts of these Egyptians again. This is really interesting to me because when I read this, it was the third time, I believe, in the whole chapter that he said, I'm going to harden the hearts of Pharaoh. I'm going to harden the hearts of these Egyptians. And to me, it just kind of resonated with me in a way where it was just like, okay, it seems as though God is prophesying, hey, 
this is what's gonna happen. I already know what they're gonna do to you. I already know what they're gonna say to you. I already know the situation you're about to find yourself in. I already know. I've actually ordained it to be that way. And sometimes we don't like to think about that. We don't like to think about like the bad that happens to us is ordained by God. Like he's okay with that. He's okay with us going through some things. He's okay with us, you know, going through the struggle um, because glory's gonna come to him. He's gonna pull us out of it. It's already ordained. It's already written in his book. He's gonna pull us out of it. And when he does, he is going to be glorified because of it. When he does, it is not gonna be something that we could have done ourselves. He is going to make it so that we kill that thing, that that thing is, is demolished. Not that we just are you know, conquerors, but that we are more than conquerors in a situation so that he gets the glory, so that he gets the glory. Then not only does he operate in our lives in that way that has us feeling like, God, only you could have done that. But then the people, our enemies are like, okay, that has to be God. That has to be God. God has to be with that person. There's no way that they survive that without him. Okay, so let's move on. So in studying the scripture, um, studying this chapter, is something that I wrote down as well and I want to read it exactly how I wrote it down. Is it possible that we are too sensitive and take things too personally? Is it possible that when we are under attack by our enemies, it's because the Lord has hardened their hearts? That it's not really about us? Think about it. Maybe it's not a personal attack. Maybe it's an orchestrated situation. But we have become so engulfed and taking things so personally and falling into offense that we think, oh, they just hate us, they don't like us, or it's the enemy. But is it possible that it's not even about us? It's not even about you. God has ordained it. And he said, hey, I need this to happen because I need this to happen here. And I need this to happen here. And I need some strength to be put into this person in this area. And I need to pull out some gook out of this person in this area. And the only way for me to do that is to allow them to go through some tribulations. Allow them to be uh, persecuted in this area. Allow them to have to go without their light bills being paid. Allow them to have to sleep on the couch of a friend. Because it's going to harden them. It's going to build them up. It is going to show them my glory in their lives. So we're going to jump down to 18. And then he said in verse 18, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariot, chariots, and his horsemen. So once again, he is saying, hey, I'm doing this. And guess what? I have multiple reasons why I'm doing this. I have multiple things that are going to be worked out after this is all said and done. Not only are you going to be rescued from your enemies, not only are you going to be completely covered and redeemed, but I am going to make it so that your enemies can even know who I am. That I'm going to use a situation that you, for your enemies to even look up and say, whoa, wait, this is God. This is God. Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel. So he was at first going before the host of Israel. Moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. When the Lord has assigned you to do something and you are in the will of God, there is automatically an angel assigned to you to help you fulfill that thing that God has called you to do. Automatically. As soon as you say yes to that thing, as soon as you listen and, and obey that command and you are setting out to do something that is harder for you to do by yourself, God will assign an angel to help you, to assist you into that endeavor. Okay, so we're going to read 19 again. The angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Not crazy about that translation. There's another translation to that that says the cloud turned into fire and it separated Israel and Egypt. And something I want you to understand is there is protection that will follow you after you've done the hard part. After you've done the hard part that God has called you to do, there is protection that comes to follow you. After you've done the hard part, the hard part is when you had to face your fears, okay? The hard part is when you had to walk by faith. When you had to call the things that are not as though they were, when you had to pray through the trial, when you had to love a person who was pretty unlovable. After you've done your part, the Lord will separate you from your enemies so that now you're out of reach. You see how there's steps to this. There are steps to this. 
verse 21 then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong with a strong east wind and all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground the waters being wall to being a wall to them on their right and a wall to them on their left the Egyptians pursued them and went in after them into the midst of the sea all Pharaoh's horses all his chariots all his horsemen that 600 of the best them yes and in the morning watch the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptians forces and threw the Egyptians forces into a panic that 600 best those horsemen uh, all of his troops all of his horsemen all of his um, uh, army yeah those he said you know what I'm going to throw that all into a panic. And so he said, he's cl clogging their wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So here we have 600 of Pharaoh's best chariots. They made it very clear that these are his best chariots. He got all his troops together. He got all of his men together, all his armies. He even told them to bring their chariots. Okay, so he's in all his splendor and all of his best of the best. He cannot come up against God. What looked like the best is now weak and failing. So we went from earlier in this chapter where the Israelites looked up and was in fear and panic because they had nothing and, and was completely in a vulnerable state and has now, to now in the later part of the chapter, they are triumphing. So when the Lord moves in your life, everything has to surrender. When the Lord moves into your life, in your life, everything has to surrender. So no matter what it looked like, no matter how strong it is, no matter how much money they have backing them, no matter, no matter how much, how many people are by their side and rooting for them, no matter how powerful the power company may be or how many people have been evicted in your apartment complex, when the Lord moves on your behalf, everything has to surrender. When the Lord is fighting for you, it is clear who's fighting for you. There's no question, no question at all. We are going to jump into verse 20, 25. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea and the waters so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hands of the Egyptians and the Israel, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord had used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So the Egyptians are now dead, and they're washed up against the seashore. They could have died and drowned. God wanted to wanted the Israelites to see their victory, to see who they just defeated. He wanted them dead in front of them. Don't wait until after. Don't have to see what God can do in order to put your faith in him. We should be faithful through the battle, knowing that the Lord will rescue us. And then, and then after the rescue, we are to be in awe of his goodness then we are to be in awe of his goodness. Thanks for watching.